Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 25. I am here with a very special guest today, Jason Perez from Every Night is Game Night podcast. And we're going to be talking about a very important topic, talking about mental health in the geek community, in the board game community. He knows far more than I do uh, on this subject, so I'm very excited to uh, have this discussion. How are you doing today? Hey, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I saw the call on uh, that you made out on Twitter. You're like, oh, we should have more guest hosts. I'm like, all right, I got some free time. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Thank you. The, what was the Patreon people? I got some streamers back there. Say hi. Yeah, yeah. I think they maybe got someone watching from Patreon here. Thanks right. for the, the call out we always try to do. If you do want to watch our podcast recorded live, uh, go ahead to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer and help me run all of this and you'll get to listen to the podcast and watch them live. So let's jump right into it. You are a, what's the, what's the technical term for your profession? So I am an LCSW, which is okay. a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, I currently work as a psychotherapist with a private practice in Connecticut and I also work as a therapist on the online platform Talkspace. Talkspace, if people have heard of that. I have not heard of that. Tell me more about that. That's That sounds really interesting. Well, there you go. I'm um, surprised it hasn't popped up on your Facebook feed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's, it's online therapy. Uh, it's basically they set people up with chat rooms. Uh, and you can chat with your therapist basically anytime. Like I, I'll check in in the mornings and evenings and people just leave in, you know, venting or are they working on something or they, you know, the video and all that kind of stuff. And I just log in and they have access to me. So, you know, I do that after I get home from private practice. So I have a lot of therapy <laughs> in my day. Oh, wow. Yeah, I bet. So is that is that text based? Like they just send in messages or do you? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, kind of thing. Uh, Chat room. Yeah. And you can leave audio messages too, but most people uh, prefer to chat or just write stuff. It's about, I'm basically like a journal. <laughs> it's like a journal that talks back to you. Sure. Yeah. That, that's really cool. So one of the reasons I sent out, like you said, that Twitter message asking for collaborations and people on the podcast is I want to get a wider range of perspectives and mental health and depression is something I've talked about before, just based on my own personal uh, experience and struggle with it. But I only have that personal perspective, which is, in, you know, in some ways valuable, but having someone who actually is knowledgeable about the topic is really exciting. Let's start with uh, what depression is, I guess, from a more precise viewpoint. What what does it mean if someone is depressed from your perspective or what's like the, the general medical uh, definition? I think it would probably be more useful to, I guess, distinguish depression from sadness. So I think everybody knows what that is, right? And you know what it is to, to be sad, to feel the blues. We just like we just had the first nice day up in Connecticut in about four months. <laughs> you can actually walk outside. So like before then, people can just like walk around and they're low energy and their faces are all sullen. Mm -hmm. And that's sadness, right? People know that. And I think – I still get a lot of people who don't know the difference between sadness and depression, you know? So like when I talk about sadness, I'm talking about a mood. So, and moods change, you know? So you could be sad, you could be down, you could be in the, you know, feeling all that stuff, but it's, you're going to come out of it. Like, you know, you can kind of see, you know, where you got into it, where you got out of it. The moods kind of changed a little bit. Depression is just like another level. Like it's not different. It's just an order of magnitude, more profound, more persistent. I think that's a, a big hallmark of it when it's like um, it, it, you're sad, but it, 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 you can't even see your way out of it, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people can tell you and this is where people and this is where this is where kind of the misunderstanding comes in, where, you know, if you, you say I'm depressed and then people say, oh, get over it. You know? I had one client say, oh, they didn't have depression when I was a kid. So you know, yeah, they, like, it didn't is, exist. Right. Like, like, this is a new thing, you know, and we can get into, you know, the whole cultural stigma around depression, and all that kind of stuff. But just like uh, when I treat it, when someone says I'm depressed and I'm assessing, you know, uh, and we'll go into the DSM stuff in a second. But like the thing that I'm really looking for is that the depth of it, the persistence of it, your inability to kind of get out of it. 
And then I guess the way it impacts your life. So when you're really depressed as opposed to sad, it's going to impact your life. It's going to impact your job. It's going to impact your ability to enjoy things like you're just not going to do the stuff that you enjoy anymore. It's going to impact your sleep, your hygiene, your cleanliness even. It, like, it just has these very obvious ripple effects. So it's not sad. I mean it is sadness but it's such a deeper level that it's just it, – it's kind of – I don't know. Like, I don't, do you have like when, cause you've talked about, it, you've been pretty open about the podcast. It's really on the podcast. Like I heard that one, I think mini so that you did like, mm-hmm. could, like maybe kind of talk a little bit about from your perspective, like that difference for your experience between depression and just sadness. Yeah. So my father had depression and it severely impacted him. And he always described it as a cloud or a fog. Like it was, it was a haze on the world. And I've heard that from other people that, it feels like there's just a cloud over everything. Everything's gray or dim. To to describe, as you're saying, something that's not a phase, but that is a kind of reality of the world. To me, the way I've always felt it is that it is, and this is going to make me sound nerdy, but it's the way I process the world, is that it is a different logic. Like there's a different logic in my brain. In other words... Someone, you know, a non-depressed person gets some kind of outside stimuli, something happens during their day, and there's kind of an emotional logic to it. You know, maybe it's something that that makes them happy and they, they enjoy it or it makes them sad. When I'm feeling really depressed, everything that happens to me goes through the logic that results in me thinking about my own worthlessness. So mm-hmm. everything, everything... All the ideas in my mind, they go through a progression, I examine them, I think about them, and they all reach the same conclusion. Yeah, it's like a, <laughs> it, like your brain turns to a funnel, right? And, and it doesn't yeah, matter what yeah. can go in there, it just funnels into these, what, what in my field, and I'll talk about like how I approach psychotherapy in a bit, uh, but we call it a core thought. And the core thought is always something negative and self-judgment blaming. So like, I am worthless, I am stupid, I am ugly, like every single aspect of it. So like, it could be a sunny day, and then a sunny day is like, oh, but I'm really tired. I don't want to go enjoy the sunny day. Oh, why am I so tired? You know, I must be really weak, and oh man, I'm so, I'm such a crappy person. Right, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. You know, and it just, it could be anything. Like, oh, I just got a new board game. Uh, oh, wow, just uh, this Amazon ship became, oh, I can't afford it. You know, how, why am I buying things? And it, it just... Yes, it, that is exactly how a good way to kind of understand the difference. Like when you're sad, like you you could identify as you're sad, even when you're grieving. Like if you're grieving and you're you're you're, you're uh, you've lost somebody, you've lost something, or whatever it is, there's you don't get that turn inward. And I think that's a good way to think about the experiential idea of this turning inward of you know when you're really depressed. That's where I would like to encourage people, and this is what I'm really excited about being on this podcast for. Like, you know, when you're starting to do that, when you're when it's starting to interrupt your life, when it's starting to be like that persistent fog feeling, and when you're starting to like really take everything, everything that comes at you and to just kind of like turn it into this negative self-judgment, then you're in the realm of depression. And that's where you start to have to think about, okay, you know, do I need treatment? Do I need extra help? And that's a barrier that I still like, you know, I'll, I'll encounter families, I'll encounter like people who just don't want to engage in treatment because they think that all of sadness is sadness and they can overcome it themselves. I get that. I get, you know, people wanting to kind of not help themselves. But at the same time, you know, there's sometimes like, I mean, we're talking about something and this is another part of depression. It affects your brain chemistry too. Like, you know, and this is something that we don't understand at all like you'll hear stuff about serotonin and dopamine and serotonin reuptake and all that kind of stuff like yes and (laughs) right right yeah yeah yes and it is all true and we might get to this we might get this into this more a little bit later but from my understanding like from just a, a a chemical standpoint like we kind of know what's going on there and we know that dealing with serotonin has good results frequently but Correct me if I'm wrong, but like neurologists and people don't exactly like there's a lot to be uncovered in terms of brain chemistry and what precisely is going on there, right? There is a t- like I'm not a I don't come at it from like the research biology end of it. I just come at it from the treatment perspective and like how different medications work and all that kind of stuff. So yes, there is. There, it's not as easy as saying oh the brain lacks serotonin, or if you want to get really technical, like 
the brain is uptaking serotonin too fast. So like it'll shoot out serotonin. Serotonin makes us feel good. But then it'll just like take it away <laughs> really fast. Oh, yeah. uh, so, so then, you know, that's why you get the the real it's a it's called the inhibitor. So like you want you want to make sure that, you know, you, you take that SSRI uh, so it doesn't take away the serotonin that fast. We know that it works. But if it was just the story, then then SSRIs would work for everybody. And literally, like, there's some people that take them, they feel great. A lot of people take them, and it's nothing. <laughs> so so yeah, I yeah. guess that's the best way to say it is, like, okay, it is a part of the story for some people in their depression. It actually works. And it's definitely something I like to highlight because there is biological stuff behind this, too. Like, all the stuff we're explaining, the whole thing about the bad logic and everything and the experiential part of it, I'm sure – I think people can just dismiss that. But I wish that we had like sophisticated enough X-ray technology to like show people what's going on in people's brains when this is happening. Like this is real stuff. I mean, oh yeah, this is like and, and we just we just don't have the tools to understand it yet. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It definitely exists. We can definitely affect it. So we just need to you know kind of be a little bit more humble about like you know we don't understand what's happening, but we know it's there. So let's treat it as opposed to just kind of dismissing it as, oh, you're just sad. Just get over it and you know, do right. your thing. Well, it seems it seems to me like we know we know a piece of it, right? We know that serotonin is significant, and we know right. that this medicine can work. And just because we don't have the full picture yet, and there's still lots of research to be done, and all the you know all the chemists and neurologists and, and, and such have work to do, doesn't mean that the treatments we've identified now aren't working. Because I know it's made a huge, a huge difference in my life. And it's something, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around topics here a lot, but it's something that, that really interested me when I first went to therapy a couple years ago. Well, I, I did a little bit in college, but not much. But when I, when I first started seriously going to therapy, it surprised me how pragmatic it was. Because mm -hmm. you always think of psychology as kind of esoteric and, and, you know, not particularly solid, but then my therapist. Tell me about is, your dreams. Tell me about. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. All that like Freudian <laughs> stuff, right? And like, I know that like, you know, we've moved me on Freud, but it was, it was surprising to me that it was like, okay, what specifically is happening in your life in reality that you want to fix? Okay. Let us work on steps to fix that. Like it was, it was incredibly pragmatic and incredibly down to earth. And tying this back to the medicine thing, I feel like people think of drug treatment or whatever you want to call it as something more out there than it is. And the reality is that we know s certain drugs work. We're willing to try them out. And sometimes it takes a couple and it took a couple with me, but we know that it can work. Therefore, right. it's a, it, it is a good option to have. <laughs> like it's, it's very basic logic rather than something that's really wishy-washy or really academic. Yeah. Like I think, you know, I guess a good example would be like a car, you know, if, if something's going on with the car, then you're not just going to say, oh, well, I'll just keep on driving the thing and it'll resolve itself. You know, it, you got to go in there and you got to fix it. And sometimes it takes like, you know, you have to put an actual fluid in there, right. like an alternate kind of fluid. It's like, I think people think like, you know, that pills, you know, they, they have the stigma against pills. Like, let's just call it what it is. Sure. It's a stigma against medicine. It's a stigma against pills. I had one client, in fact, yesterday, uh, I was a teenage girl and the mom was like, no, I'm not poisoning my child with this garbage. And <laughs> fine. That's, that's, you know, that's uh, totally up to you. We, we still are kind of mixing and matching and not understanding exactly what, what these medicines do. But, you know, there are definitely neurochemical imbalances that you can, observe just in the effect so like we can't like zip you know zap and you know a x-ray in there and see it but we can observe it by the effects because we know what these medicines do so yeah i mean and i think like the medicines work in tandem with the psychotherapy piece like you were saying before and i'll i'll die i definitely have a whole i have a whole uh spiel on that okay i'll save that <laughs> okay okay uh on like you know how, like the practical things that people can do in order to get themselves out of depression i'm a very practical therapist i don't i don't have a couch I don't have like, you know, a cigar or <laughs> I know I had a couch when I was in my office in New York. I, used, I just I used to do practice in Brooklyn and I worked for an agency and one of the rooms had like a just giant couch. So that's, the, that's the first thing people did. Just like, I'm just going to lay on this couch and start talking. <laughs> the the first person I went to around here had a couch, but she sat on the couch and then I was on a chair. No. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was troll. like, is this some kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Are they like <laughs> subverting their own practice here very subtly? <laughs> I don't know what it, I, th- I think she just liked a couch to sit on. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, <laughs> that, couch, that couch is awesome. We had a, it was a nice big plush couch and everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm also, I'm a, I'm a bit practical in my approach. But so it, it's it's both. Like, I mean, I always joke because uh, I'm in an office with a bunch of, we have uh, psychiatric nurses that prescribe. And I always joke with them that my job is to put them out of business because I, in the ideal world, I don't want people to be on this medicines. I think that, you know, I'm a big believer that if you change your thoughts, you can change reality. Like, mm-hmm. So I'm, I am big on like techniques in terms of thinking, visualization, all that kind of stuff to kind of get you out of it. But I got to recognize that sometimes just thinking won't do enough. Like it's, you know, at, you can encourage somebody to run and get themselves off the thing, but if they have a broken leg, they got to do some actual treatment to fix it. And I, I see that's how, that's the role that I see medicine in. So I know that people, um, I know we're not really talking about the gamer community, but specifically we'll get into that part in a bit. But, you know, I, I guess, you know, kind of lurking on forums, lurking, see, seeing how we interact with each other in the in the gaming community, whether, especially on Reddit, unfortunately, maybe not slash all board games, that's, that's a place that's pretty cool. But like, you know, in other kind of geek areas, we're really mean to each other. Oh yeah, <laughs> and, you know, and no wonder. I mean, people no one that that triggers depression for us. And you can you can actually. I know this is, sounds going to very sound very new agey or whatever it sounds like, but you can actually be expose yourself to that stuff so much that you alter your own brain chemistry and you get depressed. And that just that kills me. I, every time I see that oh, kind yeah. of thing, it's, it's it's a nightmare. On that point specifically, I think people. Because it's on the internet, they think that it is somehow less harmful. But it's like if you grew up and your family was that mean to you day in and day out, you would no one would blame you for being a depressed person. Like just being assaulted by such negativity and attacks and stuff you see online all the time. If you really think about it, it's obvious it's going to have an impression on someone. Like it's going to change how someone sees the world yeah especially when you're younger so like when you're teen and that's where we you know we in terms of online culture at least we get a lot of teens Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) it's where it's where teens live it is definitely the most like impressionable age like i'm 40 uh and i still can sing songs from when i was 15 like the offspring song come out and play came on the other day had listened to it in 25 years and i knew every word Mm-hmm. So like the same thing can happen to that kind of negative messaging of the the bullying that, you know, so that, that somehow can go on, especially around geeky culture. Like I know one of the things that you talked about, like in terms of like the correlation between depression and like geek culture, I think the strongest correlation happens when we consider the question of bullying and clicking out and my group is better than your group and you're stupid and like the, and it, it it especially hits us, it hits us at all ages, but especially when we're younger, it really can like kind of make a big dent in us. Like I can't tell you the amount of times that I've treated a person kind of in their early twenties, late twenties, or whatever it is, where the work is to kind of undo some of that messaging that they received when they were teenagers, because it just it if you get it as a teenager, it's in there. You know, oh, it yeah, takes a yeah. lot of work to get out of there. Yeah, swinging back again to the. The practicality points. I really want to emphasize this, that I was always really hesitant to go to therapy. And like I was saying, when I come in and it's like, okay, we're going to work very specifically on these things. And it was just very practical, good advice and nothing, again, really wishy-washy or academic about it. That was so encouraging to me. And when you describe like, okay, when does it stop being sadness and when is it depression? Well, when it affects your life. There's no like magical scale that you have to understand of how sad you are to know if you fit in this category. It's it's things like, is it affecting how you do your work or is it affecting your sleep or is it affecting your relationships? It's all real world pragmatic things that we're talking about here. It's nothing yeah. that you need special knowledge to know about. And I think a lot of people who are hesitant to go to therapy – you know, they only have their own feelings and they can't feel what other people are feeling. So there's always this doubt of, well, I'm not quite sad enough or maybe mm-hmm. I'm not actually depressed when the question isn't 
necessarily is do you fit in this category, although it kind of is. But the question really is, is this negatively affecting your life? And if it is, therapy can help. Like that's the yeah. that's the extent of the conversation that needs to happen in your mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So okay. Um so I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. I yeah, yeah, go into that. Have, uh people may have heard of it. Actually it's funny, I just did the time stories the new module, Estrella Drive, and they actually mention the person, like one person in the module had gone to a CBT therapist because they were big in the 60s. I'm like, wow, cool. Nice. <laughs> I'm a dork. <laughs> I pop for that kind of stuff. <laughs> so like, okay, we understand like what, how, how it's feeling. Okay, what do we do about it? So there's a couple of different strains of how to treat depression. So like the old school way, we mentioned Freud, and I think that's kind of the popular cultural, maybe, you know, especially earlier, Of like, okay, let's talk about your childhood, like, you know, before teenagers or whatever it is. Let's talk about your upbringing. Let's talk about your toilet training. Let's talk about, you know, and then get into your unconscious. Let's talk about dreams and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And yes, I mean, I think there, I I do some of that work because it's obvious for some people it goes back that deep. Mm -hmm. But I think the cognitive behavioral kind of revolution that happened in the 60s, especially, was that, okay, like a lot of people don't need to go back that far. A lot of people, like it's in their thoughts, I don't want to say it's in their head because that, that gets the connotation of it's fake, mm-hmm. but it's it's your thinking. Like you, know, you were saying before how th- your thinking becomes distorted. So as a cognitive behavioral therapist, I, I, I see myself as kind of, of a mental mechanic. So you know, I open the hood and I see what your thinking is. So there are you know, like automatic thoughts that can come up. Something happens and then you just automatically like think the worst thing possible. <laughs> so then you, you look at like, okay, what are the patterns of when you, when you see a thing, you think this other thing, like th- does that association need to happen? You know, so you look at the thinking, you kind of like, okay, question the assumptions behind what pops that thinking. So like if you, if you see the sun and your first thought is it's too hot or my, my skin, it's going to do it. If those are your automatic thoughts, let's just ask how that happened because Chances are that wasn't always the mm-hmm. way you thought in your life. So then highlighting those those kind of dysfunctions, like we have a whole list of like dysfunctional patterns of thinking. I can go into. I, I won't go into too much detail. Like I'll just, I'll refer people to my uh, private practice in Connecticut if you wanted to know more. <laughs> 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 I can only practice in TT, guys. Uh, stupid. Uh, uh, state lines when it comes to this licensure stuff. So then you, you get into the cognitions, you get into uh, how automatic thinking, and then I, and then it kind of tumbles into those core thoughts. So like the core thoughts of like I am ugly, I those self judgments, you know. Like I, I try to really kind of get at that. It's like, okay, what are the self judgments that are there that are holding us back? And a lot of times they're hidden. A lot of times we just kind of take them for granted. And I kind of work towards you know challenging them. It's like, okay, are you really as ugly as you say? Where did you, who told you you were ugly? How did that get in there? Did you get, did that get in there when you were a teenager? Did that get in there because of a bullying situation? Did I get in there because of all sorts of X, Y, and Z reasons? And then a lot of times, you know, you're not as ugly as you think. You're not as weak as you think. You're not as whatever, whatever, whatever as you think. So then that's the cognitive part. And then the behavior part is now that we've addressed this cognitive stuff, how can we make changes in our lives? How can we make changes in our habits? So a lot of times habit too plays a part of it. So like, you know, uh, how many times have we decided to – do we want to diet and our habits just pull us back into eating garbage? Uh, how many times do uh, we want to call uh, our parents who we haven't called in a long time but we're just in the habit of coming home, throwing our uh, you know, uh, our jacket into the thing and putting on the Netflix and then not calling anybody? That's the behavior part, you know, changing that stuff up too because, you know, what what do we want to do when it comes to, de- you know, depression work? We want to – you isolate, then we need to connect with people. You know, your, your hygiene is bad. Let's turn that around and, you know, get yourself – get it kind of fixed up again. So looking at both ends of it, your brain and your behavior and being really practical about, okay, what's needed, what's there, and how can we change it? A little, a little bit long-winded, but I get really excited about this stuff. This is my life. I love this stuff. It's it's really cool. Don't worry about geeking out too much. That's that's what we do here. <laughs> we we get on tangents, and we get on topics, and we just it's, it's perfectly fine to just geek out and go on. That's where the hockey podcast came from. That was part Damn. of another podcast. <laughs> we just went on for forty minutes. That's awesome. uh, but that's that's great. So as I understand it, then it's. The idea of cognitive behavioral uh, psychology, or is that is that the that's the name therapy? Sorry, 
is that everything kind of plays into each other, right? So if you change your thinking, then you can change your, uh, you can you can help change your habits, which helps change the thoughts that go into your mind in the first place. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, I think it starts with thinking. Like mm-hmm. uh, it starts, it's the thing that we can control. It's the thing that, I mean, maybe just because we're in offices and you can't really do a lot of behavior change in an office. <laughs> Right. <laughs> We're not in the field or whatever. Like there's different ways to do it. Like there's like hardcore behavior therapy and there's all these different uh, – I mean CBT was in the 60s. So you have all these little offshoots now. But I guess the core of it is, yeah, I mean you look at what you're thinking is we are our own worst enemies. Our, our brains are meaning-making machines. Like we don't encounter the world unless it's mediated through something that's going on in our brains. And if that's faulty, then everything else is going to be faulty. So – we need to fix that. It's like, you know, you use that metaphor of glasses. Like if your glasses are all fogged up, you're not going to see anything, you know? So the fog talking about your, I think it was your dad talking about depression mm-hmm. feeling like a fog in CBT. We think of the fog as glasses. Your green glasses are foggy. It's like, how can we clean your glasses? How can we clean the instrument through which you, you see and engage with the world? And that is your mind. And so the thinking that's where it starts. And then you can get into that feedback stuff of, Okay, now how does this affect behavior stuff? Did, did, did this behavior change affect this pattern of thinking? And can we did we un- unlock something so that we can get further behavior change? Like, I don't leave it at thinking, but it, that, I, I think that's where I start with in terms of my mm-hmm. treatment every time. Uh, like, I really do think if you change it, if you change your thoughts, you can change the world. Yeah, actually, this podcast, like me doing this podcast, is in some ways tied to the therapy I was doing at the time because. Right. I was I was talking to her about it and I was saying, you know, I'm trying to get these reviews written, I'm trying to get the stuff written, and I'm having a really hard time writing about it. And we talked a bit about, you know, what's your writing process? How do you how do you do it? And what I'm like, well, you know, I trained in debate and speech. I generally write how I would speak. And she's like, Well, why don't you do videos or do a podcast instead oh. of writing? Cause since you feel more comfortable speaking. And, you know, I, I do think writing is a more precise way of communication. So I do value writing, even though it's more difficult for me. But just that very simple idea, which was completely obvious to anyone not me. And in some senses, you just need <laughs> someone to just say it. And then right. I went home. I'm like, well, maybe I could do also a podcast <laughs> on top of the writing. And I got thinking about that. Okay, maybe I'll give it a shot and try to do stuff. And now we're on episode 25. And it's the kind of thing, you know, at least with me, with with accomplishing thoughtful gamer stuff, it's once I get one thing done, that feeling of satisfaction helps the next and it snowballs from there. And, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of it for me was was not having it snowball the other way where I couldn't get anything done. So, like you said, the fog in my brain was, no, I have to only write I have to only do this as written content because I think written t- content is good. And, and, you know, it's just, it was just a matter of saying, Hey, you could also speak. <laughs> you could also mm-hmm. do a podcast or do video. And yeah, it, it's really practical stuff like that, that I found that w- that was, that was really helpful. And just the suggestion of the idea of, well, consider the possibility of thinking this other way or having this other thought, or what would it, what would it be like if you, thought something slightly different in some ways there we talked about there be in some ways it's too esoteric when it goes down the dream route it can also be too practical for people so like i'll often go through sessions and then the person will come out and they'll share with their friends what they learned and the friend will be like oh i was telling you that for years or i could have said that and you know, i was like why'd you pay them you know why'd you pay his copay or why'd you do his uh, thing for it i could have just done that There is an aspect to that, yes, uh, but there's a couple things I want to say to that. One, we're terrible at community, especially in the Western world. Like, I I think our communities are just getting weaker and weaker, and I could talk about all the sociological stuff that's going into that. Oh, yeah. So I think it's like we we have less and less resources for that practical wisdom that used to be available maybe, you know, X number of generations ago. So we professionalized it, and so maybe you do need to go to somebody (laughs) because – you take for granted that that might be there, but it might not be there, you know, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is, I mean, we do this a lot. And so just because of my experience, I'm able to kind of like see and diagnose something and, you know, like point in a technique 
faster than somebody else might have. So like, you know, you talk to your friend, or you talk to like a bartender. Some people call me like a bartender because like, they, you know, I'll just, I'll sit there, I'll be, you know, drying my glass and be, I'll just, uh, you know, flying with a piece of advice here or there. But because I've seen so many different things and I've seen all sorts of folk, man, I've seen, I, I saw a voodoo priestess once in session. That was really cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I've seen kids, I've seen, you know, um, gang members and all sorts of folks. So when you deal with somebody like that, who has that experience, you're more likely to get a tool that will directly help you faster than if you just used your normal way of life. Sometimes you just need to kind of change it up a little bit and a therapist can really help you do that to, like you were describing before, like help you see something in a different way that you didn't see it before. And like in hindsight, it looks so obvious, but it isn't. Like it's like a blind spot in a car. Like all you have to do is lean out and you'll see something, but we don't lean out. The blind spot's always there. And, you know, you need that prod. It's like, oh, 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 that's a blind spot, you know, and that's what that's what a good therapist can do. A bad therapist? Eh, not so much, but I'm not going to defend the bad therapist. It's all about good <laughs> therapists. <yeah. laughs> Would you agree that to some extent it's just the fact that it's someone who didn't know you before that isn't part of your group? Like y- you yeah. tend to receive words from that kind of person differently than you would your best friend, even if it's the same exact idea. Yeah, because there's something about us where it's like, you know, we're tribal, like the human, uh, human beings are very, basically tribal. So we, you know, we live in a world and whenever somebody tells us something from within that tribe, it feels so familiar that we just filter it out, you know? Right. Oh, uh, that's obvious. That's obvious. That's obvious. But when you get that outside perspective, it just kind of hits you. Oh, you see that too? Oh, that must be a problem. You know? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's that's where the, the, the therapist perspective can be really valuable. Again. You got you to gotta find a good one. There's enough bad ones out there where I just don't feel like going down that road. And you were talking about, you know, how sometimes you, and I know it happened to me a few times where you look back and it just seems so obvious. And I think some people use that as an excuse of like, oh, there's not, I'm not getting a lot of value out of the therapist. But in my mind, it's the exact opposite. If you're coming out of your therapy sessions and thinking, oh, of course that was it. Or of course that was, you know, where my, where I need to clean the metaphorical glasses. Like that's the, that's the thing that I need to work on. Like that's precisely what should be happening. Right. That's it working, not it being redundant. Okay. So I actually have a little bit of a treat for your listeners over there. Um, So uh, it's talking about being like practical. So I, I've been developing this little technique that I use in terms of, so we've talked about all sorts of stuff. We've talked about, you know, how do you how do you recognize sadness, distinguishing it, you know, distinguishing it from real depression, the persistence of it, the impact on your life, that, you know, self-judgment angle to it. Uh, we talked about, you know, how it can happen and like, you know, uh, online groups and all the all sorts of different areas. And then like, you know, how do you treat it? So this is something like a little technique that I've used in terms of people who are saying, okay, I'm depressed. What do I do now? So I call them the uh, the 10 brain food groups. So a lot of times when we're depressed, it's us feeding ourselves negative thinking, right? We feed, we either get it from the external, we get it from our you know negative influences in our lives, or we're giving it to ourselves. Like we're convincing ourselves we're bad with this, with that. I encourage my clients in terms of like, okay, what do I do now? Like, okay, I give them a list of ten things, and like, okay, pick one, <laughs> mm-hmm. and 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 pursue that. And I'll, I'll actually kind of link, I'll link it to some of the th- something that you said in a minute, I'll, and and the, uh, the thing will will kind of come up. And I wanted to tie it to board games because we're at a board game podcast. So sure. I wanted to kind of talk about it in terms of like, okay, how applicable is it? There's two food groups that board games just don't help at all. Uh, one, physical activity. So, you know, getting out there, jogging, joining a gym. You know, sometimes that's a depression thing in and of itself because you buy it and you don't go. <laughs> but like yeah. any physical any physical activity like counts, like a seven-minute workout on your app counts or, you know, something Obviously, board games don't help too much with that. Also, going outside, that's number two. Like a lot of times, like people just don't want to go outside. But there's certain areas, and I've read a, a little bit of research on that, that's like actually better than other places. I'm talking about going into like a forested area or going onto a coastline. So like hmm. there's something about the biodiversity present at those two particular locales, and they tend to be solitude anyway, that actually does – reinvigorate something in your brain and get you going again. So if you find yourself, you're kind of in that funk and that might be the the thing that you need in order to kind of get you going, that might be a thing. So that's two food groups, physical activity going out. 
more food groups, and this is something where board games kind of can kind of come in a little bit more. So number three is the aesthetic. So having a good aesthetic experience, seeing something beautiful, watching something beautiful, piece of art, um, you know, a, a piece of music uh, could be an aesthetic experience. Even like a video game, like a really gorgeous, you know, like I remember I saw like a Red Dead Redemption. It was like a big Western game on a 67 inch screen and it had like a big thing of the old West. And I'm like, wow, that looks awesome. And I just mm-hmm. had a thing at a moment. And it lifted my mood just to see that. It was, it was just like, you know, even something like like that. And, you know, a good board game could do that. Like a really, really well-made, beautiful, like, you know, good components and all that kind of stuff can really kind of give you that little pop that you need to get going. So number four is the one that, that I thought of when you, t- when you mentioned the thing about podcasting. Mm-hmm. So creating, just any creation, like you, if you make something, if you cook, if you write in a journal, if you make origami, if you, you know, knit, if you, any, any kind of thing where you, you've made, you put something out in the world that didn't exist before, that actually is good brain food. So a lot of times we get stuck with a certain kind of creation, like we get blocked in it, well then create something else and that might unlock you and get, get, give your brain that little food to keep going. So when I heard like, you know, the advice about do a podcast or start talking or, you know, create another way. I really resonated with that. Yeah, and and it's something that I've had to, one of the big things I've learned in the last year doing The Thoughtful Gamer is that when I started, I I tried to plan everything out like weeks in advance, weeks and weeks in advance. I had a huge list. Okay, I'm going to do this review and then this one and this one. And and I tried to have everything set in stone because I wanted to be organized. And then when I would get stuck on that first article, that first review, and I'm trying to force myself to get it done, it just doesn't work. It's the negative feedback loop, right? You can't get something done, and you feel bad about it, which makes it less likely that you're able to get something done. And one of the things I've had to learn is that I just need to write whatever article I can write at that moment. And so I've deliberately not made a lot of commitments to to promise people, of okay, I'm going to have this review up by this time, because I know that's extra pressure. And that's just how I have to operate right now till I get into a better groove. And so it's along the same lines. Like if you're stuck on one aspect of creation, you want to do something creative or you think it would help just create the thing that you're able to create at that moment. Right. Right. That's yeah, the, it's, it's the positive momentum. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be anything. It could be complete, utter nonsense. Like, you know, you talk, and even a famous writer like Stephen King will say, how, how could you write a book a year? It's like, well, I just write one page at a time. And if it's crap, it's crap. And, you know, sometimes I'll just write a novel and throw it in the back of my car and publish it 55 years later. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it, I, Cause it just, it, he needed it just to keep going, keep going, keep going. Especially a guy like, you know, Stephen King, cause his, his thoughts can get pretty dark. So I think he, by creating, he, he actually kind of in a weird way, keeps himself alive, you know, <laughs> keeps himself safe. So that was number four is, is this, some kind of creation and obviously in the board game space you know creating a podcast you know uh, taking pictures posting on facebook you know like making you you literally creating a facebook post actually counts in some little way and you know there's all sorts of ways in which we can kind of participate in that the fifth one is learning like education you know just like learning something new that you didn't know before and it might be again like it, it, you might get stuck in it like uh, you know you're a, you're a student or you're in a training for your job and you just it's not coming to you just like sidestep and learn something stupid <laughs> or learn something that is nice but you never even knew before you know so like i have a scientist who's a client and one of his things that he likes to do is he likes to i think uh, study ancient mesopotamian whatever whatever's and like, why'd you get into that? It's like, because it's not science. <laughs> 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 you can pick, well, like, that could be anything. It's like, well, that's just the thing I got into. So it, but it fed his, it fed him, you know, it, it, it got him going. It got him out of his funks when he would get into his funks. It's just learning something new. And obviously board games can kind of play in that too. Like, you know, when you learn rules, when you learn, it's not, that's not perfect, but you know, it, it, it's something. And when you're, when you're down in the dumps, you don't, care what it is you just want something to kind of get you going so it's just kind of a list of things so now these last kind of this group of five really falls into where board games can help like positively give you some help oh awesome um so the first one and I, and this this is maybe kind of obvious puzzles so when you go into like a old folks home you know alzheimer's dementia there are puzzle books all over the place crosswords Sudoku's, 
word finds, word searches. Puzzles activate centers of the brain that when they're active, like the whole thing is just keep chugging, chugging, chugging along. When you stop approaching life as, as a series of like kind of little problems to solve, then you're really kind of in trouble. That like That's where depression can really sink you. And puzzles don't have to just be those little puzzle books. Like it can, you know, you could rearrange your room. <laughs> I know people who get depressed and they rearrange their room and they're like try to maximize little space and all kind of stuff. Or like they'll re- redo their fridge. Like, you know, if any, if you ever have a lot of food in your fridge and you just try to figure out how to get everything and that's a puzzle, right? It's just <laughs> so, like real life Tetris. <laughs> with real life Tetris, like you're, or you're moving or something <laughs> at all counts. Like, so, I mean, you could really like look at a, a thing or whatever it is, anything in your life and just to relate to board games. So how many board games do we play, especially nowadays? These kind of big involved complex games, a sigh, the terraforming Mars. I'm looking at them right now, my game shelf, because I love those games. Like games have just become more puzzly, more involved, more thinky. And some people kind of bemoan that. Maybe we've lost something, but I think it's amazing. And I, as a therapist, I love you know, I will, I will, I will throw down, you know, uh, like a like a little simple abstract strategy game or whatever it is, in therapy to get people going. You know, because some people just like that. Not everybody, but it is a thing that people like. I don't know. Have you ever had that experience of like being really happy solving a a puzzle presented to you in a oh, board yeah. game? Oh yeah. I've always framed it in terms of competition, but in some sense, a puzzle is just a competition against an inanimate object instead of an, another person, like a pure puzzle. And board games obviously combine both. You're, you're, you have the puzzle of the game mechanics and the puzzle of the competition with the other people and, and their unpredictability. That's and the so, next food group, act, actually. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> I went to straight too far. But I always, like I said, I, I grew up in, in high school, my, my debate was my thing. It was competitive debate. And in some sense, that's the same way. It's an intellectual puzzle with facts in the world and also against other people. And so board games have really been the big thing that's given me the same kind of feeling that I had when I debated back in high school and in college of, I guess, like overcoming an intellectual challenge in the same way, you know, trying to find the right argument and debate or coming up with something really clever logically. It's the same thing as when you come up for me, at least when I come up with a new strategy or something that I, I, I miss the first time through the game that I'm, I'm thinking, Oh, I could do, I could change my strategy to, to this route and be a slightly more efficient, all those kinds of puzzle things. I, I love, and mm. I think throughout my life, I've always been happiest when I'm doing that kind of thing, which is why I think I, I've gravitated towards board games. Yeah, and, and it, it's it's not just a pleasure thing. It's not just like a, an idle pastime. It really is good brain food. Like if you br- incorporate puzzling stuff out, it doesn't have to be board games. It just happens to be a really great outlet for it. In your life, you will kind of see the long-term effects of it. People who, who incorporate that kind of thinking in their lives for a, over the long term really do find you know good effects. They're able to kind of stay healthy longer. They're, st- they're mentally sharp a little bit longer. So I, I can't say enough about the <laughs> puzzles, but there's more food groups to go. You mentioned the other one, which is competition. I think you know we think of competition as, in this kind of like negative light where it's like, oh, we should really kind of get along. And you know I don't want to be versus me, and I'm already socially isolated. Why do I have to adopt that mindset? But there is a healthy spirit of competition and it could be in a sport. It could be, you know, like if you're really depressed, you don't feel like doing anything, like just logging on and trying to beat a high score that someone's put on an online game, that actually could get you going, you know, or you're in a, you're, you're playing your video game or you're playing whatever and you see that there's a thing to achieve. Talk about like achievements, right? In a, in a game, it's like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just to finish this. <laughs> I'm going to find all 150 pigeons and get the auto and shoot them all, uh, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> or, you know, or just like, you know, um, yeah, I think of like, you know, it doesn't have to just be video games or like, you know, sports or anything like that. You were saying before, like, you know, there's a competition inherent in like anything good. Like, you know, you can even do, you know, the prettiest recipe, you know, like I see Pinterest and they'll have these like little challenge things or show me your recipes. It's kind of like this thing of like, oh, you use this, I use this and everything. Or like, you know, show show Instagram, show us your prettiest photo or whatever it is. And like, you know, it doesn't have to be a stigmatizing thing. Like you just, you know, people just enjoy being challenged 
like that. And that can also give you that little bit of boost too to get you out of that depressive state. So like, yeah, those kind of like flow together. A third food group that is good for in terms of the board game world is narrative, like stories. Like I can't tell you how many people who've been so depressed, the only thing they can do is finish off that last season of Breaking Bad or that that story or whatever it is. Like that kind of gets them going. And like I, I, you'll, you might laugh at this, but I actually use Rory Story Cubes in therapy just for this part of it. Like when they when you can't think – when everything's a fog and you just see those dice and you encourage people to like tell a story off of the shapes that it gets around that fog. It hits your imagination and it starts to like get you out. Like, cause all you want is to get out. All you want is to get out of that fog and the fog is made up your, of your rational thinking. So how do you get past rational thinking? You get it past it with, you know, emotional thinking, quote unquote, if you get a past by the imagination, like other parts of your brain and stories do that better than a lot of things. So like, I think modern board games are getting a lot better at this. I have the pursuit of happiness behind me. I love that game. You know, it's like a real game, but it, you could tell like a story of being born and living and dying. You have, uh, you know, the, the dungeon calls and the adventure games and all that kind of stuff, or even just like, you know, playing a board game and generating a story out of that game, like a game of werewolf. Do you remember this? Do you remember that? <laughs> Even I, I can't stand Werewolf. I think that's a terrible game. <laughs> but people love it, you know? And right, right. They, they just remember, you know, they, they're able to craft the narrative. Because the narrative is, is, you know, you don't you can tell the narrative or tell a story in a way where it just completely excludes your present reality. And you could put yourself in that new narrative. And it just creates enough of that that leverage to kind of distance yourself, if that makes sense. Oh, and I, yeah, I know yeah, yeah. I was really about to ask, like, is there something... Uh, psychologically different from specifically reading a narrative as opposed to reading something else. So any, you know, ex nonfiction. There um, is a definite difference between like fiction okay. and nonfiction. And, yeah, it, I mean, and, it, and it's the separation. It's, it's putting yourself, it's, it's like the, the uh, empathetic aspect of it, of putting yes. yourself into someone else's shoes. The, yeah, the, there's a personal investment. There's a personal connection. There's, you know, a lot of the best stories are told in that first person narrative or whatever it is. Or like you're playing like, you know, one of the big old adventure games and you kind of imagine yourself as the, the the person on the seventh continent or the person on, you know, whatever. And yes, there is a way in which, because the thing is you don't get away from yourself totally. You stretch yourself. Like mm -hmm. you're including aspects of yourself that may be lost in the fog but you've rediscovered again. So you feel like a dead weight, a lump, a waste, or whatever it is. Now you're in the story. All of a sudden, you're a problem solver in the mm -hmm. story. You know? So you do that. Like it hits that personal, like you were saying before, in a way where a nonfiction thing doesn't. You know? And I, I think it's, it's a different thing. Like in a nonfiction thing, hopefully you're learning. And that's a different way in which you can kind of lift yourself out of stuff. But when the learning fails, <laughs> which it really does a lot too often, telling a good story can really kind of get you going. And I, I use that phrase a lot, get you going. Like that's what this is. Like, this is just like food. It's like this is 10 little bits of Lumbus bread. To, uh, I just heard your review of Hunt the Rhythm because I have Lumbus bread in my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because it's like we talked about before. Depression is often this kind of self-reinforcing cycle in your own mind. You know, if you imagine that as like – a circle going around and around. You have to find something to break out of that pattern. Right. Is that is that accurate? Is that what what you what you mean when you say get you going? It's all about breaking patterns. Yeah, it's all about breaking the old patterns. Maybe even setting new patterns, or just re going back to the old patterns, but in new ways. Like yes, depression is patterns, and getting out of depression is breaking that pattern in some way and reforming it so it works better for you. Yes. Uh, thank you for it. Take 55 minutes to get to that. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I got two more for you. Okay. So um, the next way in which board games can help depression is that social interaction. There is something about like, I think that I've heard Jeff Engelstein on the Luke podcast called the board game, the magic circle mm -hmm. where you enter a world where it's different, like the rules are different, like the modes of interaction are different. There's ways in which, you know, there's things that are accepted and not accepted, like don't move my piece for me or whatever. Yeah, we, you know, we or, call it the bubble in our group, the board game the, bubble. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, but the thing is within that bubble, you're not the weak person, you're not the crappy person. You are a respected 
and capable opponent uh, to a person. Or if you're playing a co-op game, you're a partner in whatever you're accomplishing. In the, like you're adopting some kind of identity and you're, you're using faculties that you would normally use in that bubble. So it creates that social interaction where maybe in like your real life, the social interactions are negative. You're this, you're that or whatever it is. When you're playing a board game and, you're, and everybody's kind of in it and the people are respecting the bubble or the circle or whatever you want to call it, it's awesome. You know? mm-hmm. it's, it's, and when you're in any kind of genuine social interaction where there's no judgment or at least the judgment's good, like, hey, you're a good person or, hey, you're a capable opponent or, hey, I respect, you know, your moves or, hey, you know, I respect the fact that we're playing against each other and I'm having fun because you're there. I can't have this fun without you. Like all of these things, like they sound so corny, but when you're depressed, that is like that lands. Like it's, it's great. Uh, it's like awesome. It's like, okay, I, for this hour or if I'm playing, depending on the board game that I'm playing, I'm engaged in a social activity. It doesn't even have to be like a light game, like a light party, quote unquote, social game. Like it could be any kind of game where you're just like there's people around the table and they're interacting with you, you know? Sure, and yeah. once once the circle is broken, yeah, you know, whatever. But you might be able to kind of take something from that, from that experience. You might be able to say, okay, wow, that felt really good. <laughs> you know, I feel like a person again. Mm-hmm. And it was a weird way to kind of accomplish that. I won't say weird, an offbeat way to accomplish that. But yeah, totally. That That is food. That You know, if you're feeling depressed, just go. And you don't have to say anything. Just go to a meetup, play some games, and <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you don't even have to, you know, hopefully your meetup is kind of set friendly enough where they kind of just accept you. You know, and I, I, I've i been to a, a bunch of meetups. And I, every single time I show up, and like, I, hey, you have a room? Boom, done. I'm playing a game now. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, I, I really feel like that helps you know and so like in the in the wider world as well like you like uh, i just saw a client today who was like oh i was really depressed and then my cousin stopped by and my cousin took me to uh the gym and i just everything turned around from there it's like well yeah because <laughs> finally someone stopped by and like cared for you and that just made it's just it's magic and i, I love yeah. the fact that board games can be a real conduit to that have you kind of experienced that like i know like in terms of like when i heard your, your whole thing on depression you talked about like sometimes you don't want to play and it's like you know you just doesn't feel like it what is your experience with all that well i'm glad you brought up that i'm I'm just realizing this is a pet peeve of mine of that like every game is a social game I mean, we we have this category of social games and one of the great things about board games is that you could theoretically sit down and play a board game with someone and never speak to them but have a great social experience right. just through the interaction within the game itself it's a form of communication. You're communicating in terms of strategy, but you are doing something. They're responding to you in some way. And it's a form of communicating within the game. And I think that's so cool because sometimes, you know, I'm not, I don't want to sit around and talk with people or play, you know, or, or sit around and, and laugh a lot and play these, you know, social games. I want to sit down and, and think about a heavier game. I want to sit down mm-hmm. in front of, like you said, scythe or something like that. And, I think that's that's a wonderful aspect of board games. On the on the idea of just getting out there and doing it, you know, I think that's something that's so important for people who have a friend or have a spouse or someone who's who's struggling with depression is that you know, you don't want to like force them around to do things, but just saying, "Hey, let's go do this," you know, being spontaneous and and just trying to gently encourage that person to go Do something with you, even if Mm -hmm. it's something minor, like that can help so much, even if they end up saying no, like it's going to, you're going to, you're going to get a yes eventually, um, at some point, but that can help so much with a person, uh, who's having a really hard time is just showing up. Hey, let's go take a walk or go to the board game cafe, or, or let's pull out this game or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just for the social part of it, like when you're depressed, I mean, we talked about before it affects your life, like you radically socially isolate depending on the severity of your depression. Board games are a nice kind of trick to to cut out a lot of the garbage that you're trying to avoid and get a little bit of a genuine social experience. And that might be enough to break your pattern. And (laughs) I'm going to say it again, get you going. Yeah. Uh, and it also and then, <laughs> highlights it also highlights the importance if you are at a meetup of just welcoming people into playing the game with you. Like you hear a lot of really horrible stories of really awful people at game stores or whatever. It's always important to just think of, okay, you know, I'm going to this meetup to play some games. Let's 
make an effort to be more welcoming and right. just be, that little step of being welcoming to someone you you maybe haven't met before can can mean so much to someone mm -hmm. and then the last thing uh just to round it all out uh the last bit of food brain food that can help you out is just plain old laughter like just laughter. <laughs> <laughs> like they did a they did a study. Um, I read this and I was I was amazed. I knew it kind of on a intuitive level, but I just it was cool to see it. So like they looked at they took they took a co cohort of different like you know the same age ish, and people who were known to be like smilers and laughers, and another cohort of people who are not known for that. And they asked a bunch of people, okay, tell me the like you know guess their ages, you know the the two cohorts. In most of the cases, the people who laughed and smiled looked younger and appeared younger than people who are like taciturn and you know frowning or whatever it is. Like it, it affects you. Like the, not just like your face, but your just whole being. You just you're more alive. You're more. You have that youthful kind of whatever joy de vivre or something. Mm -hmm. Like it, you look younger. You you present as younger. You have that energy as as younger when you just when you have that readiness to laugh and smile. And it's apart from social, like it sounds really weird, but if you go to a movie by yourself and it's really funny, or you pop in a, a comedy, you know, whatever, or you like do something stupid and you don't like hammer yourself, like that one gets me. Like people just like will forget their keys and they beat themselves up. I forgot my keys. Da, 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 da. Just laugh, you know, it's funny. Or, you know, or, or you do something like kind of silly at work or whatever it is, just laugh. That can mm. break the spell. People don't, like depressed people don't know to do that. It becomes all about the self-judgment. Mm -hmm. But if you just laugh it off and like physically laugh, like you have to get into it. Then. You know, people, you, you can't be, you can't be just like, <laughs> you know, you got like, come on, man. <laughs> and I'm a laughy person just to begin with. So I'm, sure. I'm, I'm big into this one. Again, it breaks your pattern. Your pattern is, you, to, to give you that negative self-judgment. The, the pattern is to think of yourself as weak and stupid and slow. And da, 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 da. Break that pattern just by laughing at yourself. Don't No judgment, no nothing. Just you did something stupid or you just feel like popping in a DVD or something funny. Just laugh your, laugh your whatever's off and have a good time. That is good food as well. And I don't think I need to point out how board games – involve laughing i if yeah if i do then you haven't played board games <laughs> <laughs> i was i was just writing about on my on today's post about 1812 the, yeah. have you played that game i'm not an 18 xx nothing no no, no it's it's not it's not an 18 xx game it's about the war of 1812 okay um uh, from academy games it's just this war game with blocks and dice and stuff and you wouldn't think it'd be funny but well, the first time i played it i was cracking up because never in my life have I seen a board game in which your troops run away from battle so much. <laughs> you roll the dice and it's like, well, my, half of them ran away. <laughs> what am I going to do now? <laughs> like you find uh, board games are great. You find really unexpected things to laugh at outside of games where you would expect to be laughing. Although those are great too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be like, you know, the party, social, whatever games, like, you know, any game can have like little funny moments or whatever it is. Any game can have like a bad beat or, you know, a dice roll doesn't go your way. And like it, that stuff is just it's just baked into the experience. If you're not and if you're not engaging, in, it's a game like we're playing games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if games don't involve laughter, what are we doing? So to kind of recap. So I have these 10 food groups. I encourage you to like write them down. If you're a depressed person. I do this with all of my clients. I encourage you like just write them down, have a have the list of ten or, or whatever kind of you do to keep it around, and just like whenever you're feeling down, just whip it out, pick one thing, and just do it. So you got physical activity, you got going outside, you got an aesthetic experience of some kind, crafting, making something, uh, learning, education. You got puzzles. You got a, a sense of competition. You got stories and narrative. You got social interaction. You got just plain old laughter. Do one of those 10 things for yourself where you're feeling like really clinically depressed. It'll go a long way towards at least breaking out of that pattern so that you can go see a therapist or go to your local gang group or reach out to somebody who you haven't reached out to before who you know, who you know could help. Anything just to kind of get you out of that stuckness and get you connected to something that can help you. So there you go. <laughs> In terms of like super practical stuff, I hope that, you know, kind of helps let, helps your listeners and, uh, yeah. you know, people kind of branch out from there. And they only have to do one, right? <laughs> Start with one. <laughs> it's like a menu. It's like, you know, you're yeah, not going to yeah. order the whole buffet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
it's something that I've discovered throughout the last couple of years too, because like some of those just don't work for me. Like I have the hardest time exercising. I don't like it. For a long time, I was really trying to get myself to take a walk every day. I told my wife, like, make me take a walk when you get home every day. We're going to go take a walk together. And it's just not going to happen. And maybe I'll get there someday where I'm taking walks because it's a great thing to do. But I found other ways to kind of break the cycle, you know, through creating, through playing games, through all, you know, a lot of the other things you talked about. You don't necessarily have to be great at all 10 of those things. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a menu. That's all it is. It's a playbook. Yeah. You just, just call for Philly special and <laughs> call for a weird play in the playbook because these are just categories. Like within the categories, you can do all sorts of different things. Like you mentioned before how you had a trouble with writing or you had trouble writing a certain thing, but you created something different. It's with it's the same in the same group, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have trouble getting to the gym. Figure out another exercise that you can do. We have apps all over the place that can give you physical stuff. Uh, you know, you can't get down to the to the boardwalk or to the ocean. Then just you know, go to your local park or something like that. And I, I get it. When you're depressed, you just don't feel like problem solving at all. But just remind yourself that like you know, if you're if once you get that kind of mindset of like okay. I'm around, I'm not gonna like do something stupid or you know, do some self-harming thing. I'm gonna get through this, but how? At least this will like follow one of these 10 paths at least a little bit and maybe that'll kind of get you to where a, a better place. So I'm saying, I'm saying the same thing. I, again, I get geeky. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> I get great. really enthusiastic about Embrace this Embrace it, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot over geek on the Thoughtful Gamer podcast. Yes, yes, that's it. I know the thoughtful gamer. That, like, you, you, I didn't even hear anything about you, but like, I saw hmm, thought, thoughts and games. I do those. I do both of those things. I'm gonna still live to this. <laughs> I don't know. Was there anything else in particular you wanted to talk about? I think that was a lot of really great information. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so we talked about like diagnosing, like what's the difference between depression and sadness and everything. We talked about, you know, where it can come from. I do want to kind of give. I know this is a little bit of a downer at the end of the episode, but I want to say it. I want to get it out there. A lot of online forums struggle when someone posts and they have like some sort of suicide intention in their post or some sort of self-harm or other harm or I don't know what's going to happen. Like they put it out there. I don't know if you've experienced that of like people in a forum, whether it's Reddit, whether it's – like it used to happen in my old WoW guild when I used to play World of Warcraft. It was like people would post and, oh, I'm going through something. I don't know what's going to happen next and being you know kind of stupid about that. I just see that all the time and it makes me kind of mm-hmm. sad to see – I think a lot of online communities just don't know how to deal with it. Either they try to engage it or they ignore it or whatever, like it scares them or like they try to, they think they need to engage in order to be nice. The only bit of advice I have, don't be afraid to to just direct that person to emergency services right away. Like Mm -hmm. do not pass go, do not collect $200, do not mess with the person, do not think that you have to engage in order to be quote unquote nice to them. Do not think you're pushing them towards some kind of inevitable thing or whatever it is. Like if you – if someone expresses that level of depression to that the point where they're thinking of self-harm, emergency services. Just they know what they're doing. In Connecticut, you call 211. Uh, in different states, there's different things. There's different hotlines or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. You know, Hopefully, you don't have to know what that is. But if you are in a community and you do encounter that kind of thing, that is your recourse and there is no – Literally no other recourse. Like if you get the sense of these this person's serious, emergency services, and that's the best that you can do. So that's kind of my little PSA. It's great to know because you do see that a lot online. Like I've never had to deal with it specifically with a with an online group I'm part of, but it happens all the time. And you know, like we were talking about in the, in the very in the very beginning of the podcast, we don't have strong community structures relative to maybe you know in the past or in, or in other places in the world but we do have a lot of loosely aligned online communities where people feel free to be more open and in some cases that can give you some loot that they might need help and and it's great to know that that's the best way to respond to that kind of thing yeah and i think people get you know afraid of that like oh well i'm not i'm, I'm dismissing their concerns or i'm the Give it to the people who are trained to do this. Give it to the people who have the time to do this. Give it to the people who it really is a skill to, you know, helping people through this stuff and be able to admit that if you are a mod, you probably don't have that skill, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. and be aware of what that of what that kind of 
stuff can do to a community, like putting it out there and you know, kind of upsetting people, triggering people. So do not be afraid to point people to emergency services. It's not cold. It's not – just do it. You know? So end on a PSA. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Well, I think that's our podcast for today. If you are struggling with depression or mental health issues, do not be afraid to seek out a therapist. Find a good one. There's no downside to it. If you if you think you've broken your leg and you go to the doctor and you find out that your leg's just fine, that's there's no downside. It's the same thing with your mental health, and the upside is obviously enormous. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Check out the thoughtfulgamer.com. Check out the Every Night is Game Night podcast to listen to more of Jason and his other podcasters on there. Hit me up on Facebook, on Twitter, and if you do enjoy this podcast and want to help it financially, I would greatly appreciate that. Again, that is at patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. I will talk to you all again soon. Goodbye. Later, everybody. Later, everybody.